Hello, everyone. My name is Bob Estrada, and I'm very proud to be a president of the Texas Exus Alumni Association this year. And along with our entire board of directors, I want to thank you for tuning in today. It's been an unusual year for us and a very challenging time as it is for everyone. But uh, we have had to postpone some events that we always look forward to every year. We've had to figure out ways to do things virtually. And uh, either way, we're working hard to find ways to bring Longhorns together regularly. And so welcome back to the 40 acres, even if it's only virtually. Uh, we have a wonderful program for all of you today. And we're going to have fun and learn a lot from some dynamic young people who are really making their mark in the world. Since 1979, one of the biggest highlights of the Texas X's year has been the naming of the newest class of outstanding young Texas X's, uh, chosen from alumni under the age of 40 who have distinguished themselves professionally and uh, their service to the University of Texas. The 2020 winners are impressive and you'll get to hear from each one of them today. But before they get to that panel discussion, I'd like to tell you a little bit about each of the honorees. The first is Jeff Butler. He is a Paralympic a silver medalist athlete and a, an entrepreneur. In uh, 2015, he founded his first company, which is called VI Patient Telehealth, and that focuses on bridging the healthcare gap for rural and underserved uh, populations and communities. And uh, he also represented Team USA in the 2016 Paralympics in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, that's where he brought home the silver medal in uh, wheelchair rugby. Uh, since then, he's been training for the upcoming Tokyo Paralympics uh, now in 2021 uh, and will compete there and hopefully bring home gold medals for Team USA in wheelchair rugby. In the meantime, he is making plans to attend Stanford University School of Business to earn his MBA after those Olympics. Our next honoree is Gerardo Interiano. He is the head of government relations at Aurora, the company that is now building self-driving technology to deliver the benefits of the future of transportation safely, quickly, and broadly. He is based in Pittsburgh where Aurora is headquartered and he leads their effort to engage in both international, federal, state, and local governments and help them define self-driving policies and regulations. Prior to joining Aurora, Gerardo worked at Google in Austin, where he helped launch Google Fiber and Waymo in the southwestern United States. He also has had experience in government, having previously served in senior roles with U.S. Congressman Lamar Smith, former Governor of Texas Rick Perry, former Speaker of the House in Texas Joe Strauss. Uh, our next honoree is Dr. Leticia Noguera, and she is the senior principal scientist at the data science department at the American Cancer Society. She investigates the determinants of health disparities in the cancer care continuum that can be addressed by policy changes. She has made significant contributions evaluating the effects of the Affordable Care Act on cancer care and even how climate change can impact some cancer patients. She also manages the National Cancer Database at the American Cancer Society. In addition to her degree from UT, she also has a master's degree from the Harvard School of Public Health. She received the Women in Cancer Research Award and the Minority Scholar in Cancer Research Award, both from the American Association for Cancer Research and the Fellows Award for Research Excellence from the National Institute of Health. In 2018, she was inducted into the University of Texas College of Natural Sciences Hall of Honors. And our next honoree is Melanie Weber, who leads the crew and cargo accommodations for the Boeing Corporation CST-100 Starliner spacecraft. In 2019, she became the first woman and the first Hispanic person in the history of human spaceflight to lead a launch pad team on the day of a space launch. Recently, 
Weber was granted a U.S. patent for innovations in seats that provide Starliner crew members safety and comfort, and uh, she earned that uh, for the company. Uh, she works hard to ensure the safety of astronauts and has been recognized for her efforts with a NASA Silver Snoopy Award. Weber was featured in an episode of the Science Channel's Impossible Engineering, describing the Starliner's landing airbag system. And she was also integral in unveiling Bowie's, Boeing's spacesuit on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, which she brought on and explained. She volunteers in her spare time, uh, counseling and mentoring students and urging them to pursue careers in STEM related careers. So on behalf of the more than 530,000 Longhorn alumni living around the world, our congratulations to these outstanding successful recipients. Your success and your determination to change the world makes all of us very proud. My warmest best wishes to you and hook them horns. Thank you, Bob. Welcome, everybody. I'm Chuck Harris, Executive Director of the Texas X's. And thank you for logging on today and joining us for one of our biggest events of the year, the Outstanding Young Texas X's Award. Bob told you about our recipients today, and I get the honor of asking them questions submitted by some of our 40 Acre Scholars and student members of the Texas X's, many of whom I have no doubt will be receiving this honor themselves one day. Before we get to the interview, the deans of each of our recipients' schools wanted to send along their congratulations and be part of this exciting moment. So let's hear what the deans had to say. Hello, on behalf of the College of Liberal Arts, let me say congratulations, Gerardo, and congratulations to all of the outstanding young Texas X's. Thanks for all you do to represent UT and change the world. Hello, Jeff Butler. My name is Lil Mills, the Interim Dean of the McComb School of Business. Congratulations on being the 2020 Outstanding Young Texas X. Hook em horns. Hi, Melanie. My name is Sharon Wood and I'm Dean of the Coppa School of Engineering. I wanted to congratulate you on being recognized with the Outstanding Young Texas X Award. You're doing absolutely amazing things and we are so proud of you. So congratulations and hook them. Leticia, I and your many friends in the College of Natural Sciences are so proud of your work on behalf of cancer patients and your efforts to represent the College of Natural Sciences in the world. Congratulations on this latest recognition of your accomplishments and promise. <laughs> You are an outstanding young Texas ex. Friends, I'm Ward Farnsworth, Dean of the School of Law. I just want to give our warmest congratulations to our newest outstanding young Texas exes. We are all so proud of you for already changing the world. You gotta love that, especially the drum roll. Thanks uh, for the deans for spending time and taking part in this uh, great celebration today. Now, we had a lot of interest from students who clearly look up to our winners today. Y'all are leading across many fields and industries and you've made your mark at such a young age. You've overcome adversity, you've demonstrated the value of hard work and you've never forgotten where you came from. You stay engaged with your alma mater and you give back. So it's no surprise that you are compelling role models for students who aspire to do the same, and they are excited to hear from you today. Our first question flashes back to when you were in their shoes. So we'll start with when you were at UT, did you know which career you wanted to pursue? How about, let's start with Jeff. When did you know you wanted to work in healthcare delivery? Yeah, thanks so much, Chuck. First, let me just say that it's such an honor to be 
receiving this award and recognized with three other incredible individuals. Uh, looking at healthcare delivery and tech as a larger theme within that, it's really not surprising that I ended up where I did. Uh, growing up, I always had a love for computers, and in high school, I assembled my first one with a group of friends, and from that moment, I was totally hooked. Of course, when I got to UT, uh, it was natural to, to be drawn to the really strong program within the Macomb School Management Information Systems. And the only thing that I wasn't prepared for with my background in tech is the sheer amount of work involved in my seemingly never ending role as tech support for my family members, <laughs> which actually makes it a little more embarrassing that I'm the only person among the recipients who wasn't able to properly get my virtual background working. Um, I'm going to point that out, but you <laughs> pointed it out. So go ahead and take the hit. That's good. That's, that's big man. Big man. Well, well deserved. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Gerardo. Uh, Self-driving cars. Um, can't imagine. I, I, I when I had my little matchbox. I guess in a way those were self-driving cars, but we, we had to sort of push them along the way. When, when did you decide autonomous vehicles was was in your future? Yeah, so definitely not something that I was thinking about when I was a student at UT. I mean, I was exposed to the self-driving technology when I was still at Google, and had the opportunity to work with Waymo to put the first car on public roads without a human driver. Uh, what most people may not know is that that actually happened in Austin. Uh, so the first time that a self-driving car was ever put on the human road, on the road without a human driver uh, was in Austin back about five years ago. Um, you know, when I was a student, I actually started as an engineering major, uh, but this, I was not cut for it. So quickly changed uh, to liberal arts, ended up going to law school. Uh, so the advice that I have to students is, you know, don't be afraid to change majors. Don't be afraid to look at different careers and different opportunities. I'm sure uh, all of us have, have had thoughts or, or went through that process. And I think we all have this feeling that we have to know exactly what our career is going to be like and what our major is going to be from the moment that we set foot on the 40 acres. Uh, and I think the great advantage of going to an institution like the University of Texas that has so many top tier programs across so many of the different colleges is that you truly have an opportunity to discover yourself and decide where it is that you want to have that impact and where it is that you want to make a difference uh, and, and explore those different opportunities. Uh, so don't be afraid to take that leap of faith. Uh, take courses outside of your college. Take courses outside of your curriculum. Uh, you never know what you know what you find out exploring those different opportunities uh, and, and look forward to, to visiting with you. And like Jeff, incredibly honored uh, to be here with all of you guys, to be uh, with the 40 Acre Scholars. What an incredible program uh, and what incredible achievement for all of those uh, that, have, that, that are able to be a part of that program. So congratulations to all of you guys as well. Thank you, Gerardo. Gerardo. Leticia, Leticia, cancer research. Uh, not a uh, thing to tackle. Um, did you have a mentor or an inspiration that, that led you into such a, a, an important and, and obviously talk about world changing uh, field. Yes, I did. So similar to Gerardo, I did not know exactly what I wanted to do when I first joined UT. I was actually working with plant genomics and I had an amazing mentor uh, who actually was uh, who I consulted during my prelim as part of the PhD program at UT. You have to come up with a project that has nothing to do with your actual research. And that's when I ended up doing cancer and obesity as my prelim project and switched topics halfway through my PhD, which at the time was a very scary decision. But with that switch came an amazing mentor, Dr. Stephen Hurstings, who is one of the few senior scientists I've ever met who could hear uh, a student with a hypothesis and provide all of the uh, support that is necessary and as equals really find a way to design the study uh, and he was also very supportive and encouraging when I decided to switch career paths and more and go more into an epidemiology and public health focus after finishing my PhD which is also not the way things are usually done to get your master's afterwards. So as Gerardo was saying, don't be afraid to switch and take classes outside what you think you should be doing. Um, I think that that's a great advice and such an honor to be here uh, accepting this award with these three amazing people. I'm truly honored. Fantastic. Epidemiology had to be one of the most 
Google terms following the first coronavirus uh, press conference. Yes. Uh, we had to all learn what what that was. So obviously very proud of you, Melanie. Space flight? Are you kidding me? Like that's got to be like the coolest job on the planet. Like no pun intended. Um, but as you as you sort of think about that, um, broken through barriers in your field. What was what was your bit first big break? That's got to be wildly competitive to get into that. But what was your first break that led you and uh, where you're in the space to get you into the space flight industry? Uh, yeah, so um, I knew at a very early age that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, thankfully. Uh, so I kind of knew what I wanted to do and I just kind of had to line things up and there was a little bit of luck or maybe a lot of bit of luck involved to get me to where I'm at today. Um, I had an opportunity to join a rotation program with the Boeing company for a brand new spacecraft that they were developing for NASA. And it was called the CST-100, now the CST-100 Starliner. There was only a few of us selected um, and you could do whatever you wanted to do. So when I was selected to be part of this rotation, they asked me, what do you want to do? And it, they said, whatever. I, I thought about interior design of the vehicle. I was a structures person, awesome. so it was immediately, I want to design the interior. Um, and then they're like, well, what else do you want to do? And I was like, well, I could do landing recovery systems. I like parachutes. Why don't I start doing that too? And so we were just really lucky that we could do whatever we wanted. It allowed us to work into many different roles and aspects of the program, learn as much as we could, um, and really get into anything that w was interesting to us. And from that, I was able to continue on the role that I'm currently in and just develop the interior of the spacecraft uh, to what it is today. Have you ever um, sat in any other vehicle that you've been satisfied with since you started working in that job? Uh, I have been in an Apollo module, actually. That was one thing they let me do. Uh, I believe it's the Apollo 17. I'm oh, sorry, Apollo. Yeah, Apollo 17 module. And uh, it was our kind of our kickoff to start really designing the seats, the crew seats. So they let us, me and my coworker, who was the subsystem lead at the time, uh, get into the crew module. And we're, we were able to go, hey, we were thinking about this. That would work. This works. Oh, I can see where we've changed over time. So that was very interesting, yes. OK, I got to ask one question. Cup holder or no cup holder on the interior? You know, we had an idea for what we called the glove compartment. Yeah, each like crew member would have their own little compartment uh, where they could have quick, easy things, but that actually got moved to the suits. So okay. the suits actually have pockets for easy access. Perfect though. All right, so the next question, it's our round robin round. So this is gonna go to all of you, and this is from a student member who asks, tell us about your favorite class uh, and UT and why. Um, so let's start with, how about we'll go, we'll stay in the same order. Jeff, how about you go? Yeah, of course. Wow, great question. Um, I think probably my favorite would have been a class titled Web Application Development. Specifically, I even remember 333K, and it was with a professor named Rick Byers. He was one of those professors that would the first day of class bring his guitar in and play it for everyone. He always preached the importance of work-life balance. But what was interesting about that is the class had nothing to do with work-life balance. It was just work. Um, it was it was one part soul-crushing quantitative work just reams of code. I, I, didn't, I don't know if you can measure code in reams, but that's probably how they would have measured it. Um, mixed with two parts, you know, awesome gratification once you are able to get through the course. Um, the primary objective was the class of the class was to, with a team, build this web application from the ground up, and we had just learned how to code at the time. So it, it was, it was a lot of long nights, lots of Red Bull, lots of coffee, slamming your head against the keyboard, the deep, you know, getting angry at the debugging features. Um, but I think universally, most of the MIS program alumni look back at it with, with some fond nostalgia, um, but it absolutely set us up with a great foundation for what software development is like in the real world. That's kind of like, uh 
your first experience at a startup, right? The soul crushing amount of work and the never ending hours. It's uh, it's always gets uh, startups always have so much glamour associated with them, but it's really obviously a lot of work, but it is hugely rewarding, of course. But hey, I know a drummer we could introduce that professor of yours to. Uh, hey, Gerardo, th same to you, man. Yeah, as I think for me, it would have been uh, interpersonal communications with Dr. Daly. Uh, John Daly was the professor. It was my favorite course by far. I think part of it was because it had nothing to do with my major, right? So I was an economics major. This was a communications uh, school, and it was exciting to get outside of the rhythm and roll of, of numbers and of uh, economics. But the thing about that course is that the skills that you learned in interpersonal communications are something that would have been applicable to any career that I would have chosen, right? Even more so today in, in, in light of COVID and in light of having to do so much by video conference and by telephone, right? Like communications is even more important today than it was just nine months ago, right? It's a skill set that we certainly always look for when we're hiring. Uh, and how is it that people are able to communicate both verbally and, you know, in written form? Uh, and the, the reality for me is that Dr. Daly ended up being a great advisor to me. He helped me, he taught me how to write, right? Like he not only taught me how to tell a great story, but he also took the time to sit down with me and teach me how to write. He helped me write my personal statement to go to law school. And I, and I was really, and I still am today, indebted to him uh, for his help in getting me into law school. But even professionally, uh, he and I remain friends. And he's one of those professors that I continue to go to over the years. Anytime that I'm facing, you know, any type of major communications challenge or major issue in my career, uh, he's, he's one of the professors that I stayed really close to. And again, the, the skills that I learned in that class are, are still applicable today. And, I, and I'm sure that they're going to be applicable the rest of my career. Yes, writing. I hope it's not a lost art in our world of 120 characters and so forth, but um, it, it's a good lesson to all those listening is uh, perfect your writing skills. It will, it will serve you well. Leticia. Yeah, so I think that my favorite class at UT was a tumor biology class. Uh, it was just so comprehensive, and I think that the professor had such a respect for how the research that was done for us to figure out how cancer works uh, really still is ongoing and it's a story that's constantly being told. It was like a prelude to the, the Emperor of All Maladies years before it was even published and it just gave me such an appreciation for this complex disease. Melanie, I promise I'm not gonna make you go last all night. I'll, I'll switch up last, next time. Uh, so actually I had two favorite classes. One was intro to aerospace engineering. And of course that was my first course ever, first day of college, but it was eye opening. He kind of gave us, it was Dr. Bedford and he kind of gave us, hey, this is how it's going to be if you pursue a career in aerospace engineering. And, uh, but I absolutely love that class and I knew that I was pursuing the right thing. Uh, but I also ended with history of space flight. Actually my last semester was the first time they offered it by Dr. Hans Mark who you know helped me in so many ways uh, a lot of lessons learned that he carried with him uh, including uh, what happened with Challenger and so just kind of understanding some of the good things and the not so great things that have happened uh, over time and uh, I was able to bring all of that with me and there are times when I even have to you know, talk with some of the astronauts and they're like, oh, well, I'll just have this here. And I'm like, did you not learn anything from Alan Bean during Apollo 12? <laughs> so it's kind of funny how I've been able to take, you know, so much that that he taught us at that time and really getting into all the details of what it took for us um, to be this spacefaring, um, you know, Earth. It's great. Yeah. I have a, a separate question. Did, did you all, when you came to college, know what you wanted? do when you got we were, all, we were all pretty focused so you had sort of an idea when you arrived you didn't discover it while you were here no you you did know or you didn't know i didn't know didn't know i think that's there's great stories in um i think a lot i have two college age kids and it's i was always envious of people that knew what they wanted to do but it's also what a journey to come and discover and discover your passion a lot at school it takes obviously a lot of courage to do that so all right next question um again these are uh, supplied from our audience uh, what are you most proud of 
Um, let's start with Leticia on this one. Yeah, I think that I'll have to pick a personal one for this one. If that's OK, well, what I'm most proud of is uh, getting my dad to quit smoking. Uh, <laughs> reason would not do it, so we made a bet and we r ran a race and he's a runner and I was not a runner at the time. And if my time was better than his, then he would quit. But if his time was better than mine, I would have to start smoking. So luckily. <laughs> Answer researcher who smokes, yeah. that would be a first. Yeah. That's my dad. Um, yeah, so luckily my time was better than his and it's going on 10 years now and he hasn't smoked. Fantastic. Melanie. Uh, so recently last year we did have our first uh, inaugural flight and that was eight and a half years in the making for me. So it was that moment of, yeah, we're doing this. Um, and certainly the day of launch uh, seeing Atlas V fully fueled and going up to the rocket to prepare the spacecraft for final launch. And uh, I had always dreamed of contributing to a human rated spacecraft. I always dreamed of having hardware fly and and that w came true um, last December. And I'm so looking forward to uh, going beyond and uh, earning a patent for some of that hardware was you know, very overwhelming as well. I'm very grateful for that. Um, and, you know, something I'm most grateful for is the fact that I get to share all of these experiences with the next generation of uh, space flight enthusiasts. So yeah. looking forward to keep going. Gerardo. You're on mute. Someone had to be first. Um, I would separate the two. I think from a personal perspective, right, it's the accomplishments of my kids. I mean, I, I have three little ones and getting to see their successes and getting the, getting them, seeing them excited about some of the same things that I'm excited about, whether it's politics or reading or history or, you know, seeing that same desire to learn in them is something that that I'm very proud of that, that are, they're, that's a hugely important for my wife and I. Uh, to teach them and to ingrain in them. And I think professionally, you know, I remember an old boss of mine t telling me that that his greatest accomplishment was his team. And I remember being very jealous about that. Uh, and, and so for me, I think it's the opportunity that I'm in right now in getting to build my own team and seeing their successes and seeing the things that that we can achieve as a team uh, when it comes to, to this technology and being able to deploy and, and literally write the rules of the road, right? As cheesy as that sounds, uh, what we're getting to do is to work with government to figure out how do we deploy this technology that we believe is going to save people's lives. Uh, and so getting to work with, with a team to be able to do that and, and work across, you know, international, federal, state, and local governments um, to, to help them understand how it is that we're going to deploy this technology and change the entire transportation ecosystem uh, as we know it, both from the movement of people to the movement of goods uh, is something that's really exciting. And it's, and it's exciting to be able to do that with incredibly smart people uh, and learn from them every single day. Fantastic. Jeff. Yeah, um, for me, I think in 2015, I was getting ready to try out for Team USA for the fifth time in as many years. Um, unfortunately, it hadn't been going so well. Every time up into, until 2015, I had gotten cut and not made the team fall in short. I, was, I remember I was sitting on, at my kitchen table and I was trying to make this decision like, I'm a glutton for punishment. Do I just go back? Do I hang up my hat on my athletic career, say I got really close and, you know, focus on my professional career? And I was I was really stuck on this question for a couple of days. I consulted my uh, my coaches, my family, my friends, and it was such an important inflection point looking back. I decided that you know, let's 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 do this. Let's go and try out. I made the team that year, and then I went on to win a silver medal with the team in 2016 in Rio. And what I'm most proud about is that in that moment of uncertainty, that really important inflection point, that you know, I kind of picked myself up and was like, "No, we're going to do this," and and I didn't give up. 
Hey, um, besides winning the medal, what was the coolest experience about being in Rio? Rio is the most beautiful city I have ever been in. The geography where these massive mountains just run into the ocean is so beautiful. Yeah, it's a must-see destination for everybody. Okay, so uh, we got a little bit of uh, home cooking here, so uh, get ready. Um, how did choosing UT impact your success? Uh, we'll start with Gerardo on this one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's no question in my mind that I would not be where I am today had it not been for the relationships, the professors, the internships, the you know, the doors that were opened uh, for me by by mentors, by alums uh, that allowed me to swing for the fences, right? Like, I can't tell you the number of times that it was a UT alum that gave me that first opportunity or that it was, you know, an alumni of one of the student organizations that I was involved in that was willing to write a letter of recommendation or make a phone call on my behalf. And, you know, to Bob's comment earlier, you know, over 500,000 alums throughout the world, like running into University of Texas uh, alumni has has continued to surprise me and to continue to and continue to open doors. Um, so, you know, not only did I get an excellent education and build incredible friendships, uh, but I also was able to to leverage the alumni base and to leverage the relationship that our professors have. Um, but I was recently talking uh, to somebody earlier this morning about, you know, during the pandemic, I've reconnected with six or eight of my closest friends from college. And every Friday at 4.30, we all get together and catch up and we have dealt with everything that the country has been dealing with in a really raw way, right? And, and it has allowed us to have really frank conversations uh, and helped us go through this together. So I, I would not be who I am and where I am today had it not been for, for the alumni and the faculty that believed in us. Uh, so I, I really am indebted to the university uh, for all those doors that were opened. Thank you, Gerardo. Uh, the check is in the mail. Melanie, tell us your story. Uh, yeah. Um you know, from a very early age as well, I think I was second grade wearing Texas shirts. You know, I've always been a fan for as long as I can remember. And thankfully, the Cockrell School of Engineering is a top ranked engineering program. Uh, and not only that, they offered aerospace engineering, which of course I wanted to do. So it just, it was just meant to be, I think, for everything to kind of come together. Um, and I'm absolutely indebted to the university for taking a chance on me and to the college for giving me all of these opportunities, um, the resources that I was able to take advantage, advantage of, not, you know, especially like career resources. I would make, you know, that one piece of advice to tell all the students, right, is take advantage of the resources that your colleges provide you, um, you know, whether it's interview practices, resume workshops, and, and thankfully uh, the College of Engineering also had some counselors that I was able to just stop up by and, you know, when I was having a hard day uh, going through a tough situation, uh, they were able to help me and guide me um, and encourage me to keep going on days that were especially hard. Um, and it was uh, the college that would bring in recruiters to have um, kind of show and tell of what they do, which got my resume to one person, which got that resume to a hiring manager that kind of kicked off my career. So I, obviously there was a lot of events that had to happen, um, but you know, I'm so proud to be part of um, the Cockroach School of Engineering and to be an alum. And I hope that I continue to make everybody proud. Really, I do. I don't think you have anything to worry about there. Uh, and just shameless plug for all those, the, your alumni association just launched a new platform called Hooked In that helps with networking and career access and leveraging our alumni. Since you, since you all brought it up, I just thought I would mention it. Um, Leticia. Yes, I think that uh, just being immersed in this environment where people believe in you and support you, uh, as Melanie was saying, even when you're having a hard day, it's just people that see your potential even when you might not be the stereotypical science scientist or have you know ideas that conform like climate change and cancer that conform with um, what is usually done 
And also this mentality of what starts here changes the world, that you're meant to do big things, that just keep pushing, believe in yourself, you're meant to do great things, made a huge difference to me. Live in it, walk the walk, talk the talk. Hey Jeff, how about you? Yeah, I love I love Gerardo's answer about, you know, the alumni network and the and the power that comes from that at UT. Um, one thing that sticks out in my mind about my time on campus was how at UT and specifically at McCombs in the business school, we did all you ever do is group projects, right? And of course, the reason they put you in that situation is to foster these important interpersonal skills, which translate into business and all kinds of other important aspects of life. Um, my whole career, both athletically and professionally, from being a patient to being on Team USA, has revolved around these skills that were initially developed and practiced and, you know, beat into our head, be, you know, group presentation, you know, uh, uh, that initially happened at UT. Mm -hmm. Seeing and understanding what makes a good leader, uh, finding ways to motivate a team, understanding how to deal with failure or difficult teammates, you know, all of these lessons I can trace, you know, a direct line back to my time on the 40 acres. Yeah, it's really amazing. That's I think one of my favorite talk, topics with alums is this, and it, you know, I, my roommate helped me get my first job, which led to the city I lived in, which led to the spouse or partner I found, which led to the child I had, which let you know, I, I mean, which the job, you know. So there is, it's amazing how important and how impactful this branch of your life is and uh, understanding and taking advantage of it is huge. We've got a, gr a really great question from one of our uh, audience members. Um, I love this question is and we have a perfect group for it. Um, so the question is how has a creative artistic frame of mind influenced your career? Um, so I'll start with Melanie since she's been the last one so many times yeah uh, that's a great question yeah uh, i take inspiration in uh, daily things to incorporate into our spacecraft it could be things within the boeing company um you know elements of a cockpit that we've brought in there have been times that i've been on a bus and looking at anchor points that i could incorporate into uh, our cargo strapping method it, it's you know i love taking inspiration in everything i see including movies yes we we did get some inspiration from some movies and try to incorporate it. Uh, so I I love that in my role, I really can, you know, think outside of the box. How can I make things work uh, and, and really just take take in everything around me and you never, you know, you'd be surprised at where you can find some inspiration. Fantastic. How about Leticia? Yeah, I think that uh being creative really also allows you to connect points. So sometimes you have a project or a research topic that you've been going around in circles and just being able, as uh, Melanie was saying, to see inspiration in everyday things and suddenly it just it comes to you and, and you can really see that the connection being made and sometimes a whole new family of projects is born just because you had that ability to be creative and really take inspiration from everyday things. Fantastic, Jeff. Yeah, uh, two, two things come to mind for me on this. The first is I am physically incapable of doing work without music on. So from the artistic perspective, that's really important to me. Um, this is the second piece I have is, you know, creative solutions are always the best solutions. Um, and it, it's it's simply because if it if it wasn't a creative solution, it would have been solved already, right? And so I think that that expanding your mind and opening yourself up to um, different possibilities that you wouldn't initially have thought of is essential in anything from sports to tech to healthcare. Yep, Gerardo, in the world of artificial intelligence, how does the creative mind flourish? Yeah, I mean, I, I look, I'll echo everything that everybody else said, you know, with the added caveat that I think it is so easy in today's world to get tunnel vision or to be in an echo chamber, right? Like our, the way that we consume media, the way that we consume information, we, we tend to surround ourselves by people who think like us. 
Um, so to, to Jeff's point, finding that creative solution and bringing that to the table is even more important today uh, because I think we have created these echo chambers for ourselves uh, that, that lack creativity. Um, so to be able to use that part of our mind and, that, and, and bring that creativity to the table to think of things from a different perspective and not only does that make, you, make us more empathetic in how we approach a problem, uh, but I think it also makes you just more efficient uh, as a member of any team uh, to be able to think outside the box and to be able to bring a different perspective. Fantastic. You know, the one question that's been killing me, Melody, is you got to tell us something about the Colbert show, man. Like what, what, what was that like? Like, I mean, obviously the TV part of it we get, but tell, tell us something like, give us inside baseball on what it was like to go on Colbert. Yeah, so uh, that was a lot of fun. You know, we had been prepping for that for a while, and it was really interesting when we were talking about how do we kind of promote what we're doing, and we knew he was a huge space fan. Um, he actually has a treadmill named after him on the International Space Station. Uh, so, of course, he was more than willing to come down. We said, do you want to get in a suit? He said, absolutely. He is really funny. It was his team is incredible. They were all very, very nice, and he was so excited. Uh, to be there and you know one of the funniest things that happened was I had to help him get into our mock-up and you know as soon as I got him there you know I had to ask permission hey is it okay if I touch you you know I need to kind of buckle you into our seat and, <laughs> and he was he was fine with that and then it was time for me to leave so that they could do a little skit inside there and a few days later um, I went into our mock-up to try to clean things up, take things out, um, and I had seen like a broken switch and I thought somebody else had gone in there and had had broken like a switch and I was mad. I was like, oh my, we, we need to restrict access to this thing. And then when they show the segment, it was him that broke the switch. It was hilarious. So uh, no, it was it was a wonderful time and I'm so glad that we were able to use that platform to get people inspired about space flight again because a lot of people don't know what we're doing and it, it was great that he was so interested and um you know willing to to participate in that that's great the uh okay thanks for indulging me um do you have you know we, we've um they, we've got obviously we're doing a lot around um, standing up our new platform and we're, we're delving a lot in mentoring and mentorships and we, I know you all had mentors along the way. I mean, I, I think what I find is could you provide some advice to the group on how to actually cultivate a mentor? How to, because it's, you know, you, you can, there's a difference between, hey, I'll take a call from you and give you some advice from that's the first call that ultimately leads into a meaningful relationship that becomes a mentor. So I think the cultivation of it, if you have any insight into that, would be really helpful to the group. Um, so Jeff, you're nodding, Melanie, you're nodding. So let's start with Jeff on this one. Yeah, um, I I have always leaned hard in, into mentors in my in my life, both from athletics. Um, you know, I have a really profound relationship with my coach, with some of my teammates. Um, but I think the most important thing when you're when you're you know feeling out a mentor is just to be really direct and I almost like bringing it up and, and saying you know I, I really want to learn from you I want to uh, follow in your footsteps to a certain extent you know and then just ask them to set up a recurring call um, you know if, if you really if you really click and it's it's going to be a mentorship that sticks it will um, and if it's going to fall off, then sometimes that happens as well. But I think it's really important to be direct and just tell them that you're interested in kind of having that kind of relationship. Okay. And I'm kind of just freelancing here. So Melanie, you were nodding. Um, so did, did you want to add something to that? And, yeah. and Roger and Leticia, please, if you have something, raise your hand, nod, whatever. I want to put you on the spot here. Um, but anyway. Yeah, I was uh, very fortunate this summer uh, to have numerous interns to mentor actually it was great uh, they would find me they would be like hey you know i saw on the spreadsheet that you were open to mentorship a mentorship 
uh, could I sit down and talk to you for 30 minutes? Yeah, of course, you know, here's my calendar, set something up, I'd be happy to talk to you. And I would encourage them, hey, do you wanna set up another call in two weeks? I wanna hear what you're doing in two weeks. You know, I wanna hear about your project you're working on. I wanna hear about your final project. What are you doing to try to get hired permanently? So, you know, I would make sure as a mentor to try to follow up with them, like, hey, I haven't heard from you, even if it was I am. And then of course, as they were departing their internships, you know, just let them know that the mentorship doesn't have to stop uh, there. You know, when they leave Boeing, they can absolutely, they have my email address, they find me on LinkedIn and they can message me. And in fact, I heard from two of those interns just this past week asking for some advice. So, you know, it, it, it's dual, right? You, you have to make sure that both um, parties are engaging with each other and it could just be like hey i haven't heard from you in a few months how's everything going how's school and to try to you know keep that mentorship going okay do you tisha you guys jump in if you have something you want to add i'm gonna yeah i mean I, i'll be very script here, man. We're, we're making this up now no i'll be very tactical about it right i i would start the car like this was advice given to me years ago about how do you begin to engage a mentor and you know rather than reaching out to somebody and asking for a job or asking you know the the, the question the way that it was phrased to me that that has been the most helpful to me in developing those relationships is ask somebody for advice right like it's really hard for somebody to tell you no uh, to that question, like even if even if there's a certain ego component to it, right? Like people want to give you advice and they want to be helpful. So I think asking for somebody for their time to give you advice uh, is one way to begin the conversation. But again, staying on the tactical side and following a little bit on Jeff's point, um, be very specific. Like come into the conversation and be very clear on what your goals are and do your research to understand how it is that this individual can help you further those goals. You know, if you can show them that you've taken the time to understand their background and understand how it is that they can help you at a very tactical level, um, I think that that's something that goes a really long way and that shows your interest and your willingness to commit some time to build that relationship versus just asking somebody, hey, can you just talk to me about my problems? You know, every month, be very specific about what it is that you want to achieve with through that relationship and, and don't be afraid to ask. Right, like I can't tell you the number of conversations that I had over the years of people that should have never given me any time, uh, but simply because I was able to ask and I was able to get co their contact information, um, I was able to have a small conversation with them that that was incredibly fruitful and incredibly helpful. So don't ever be afraid to send a cold email. And you know, if anybody is interested in self-driving technology or interested in public policy, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to talk to any of you about it. Yeah, I second that uh, to be specific. So not only specific on your question, but also why is it that you think this person is the person who can help you answer it? So I'm really impressed with how you transition from private to uh, government jobs or to academic positions and also um, how you might have started your own research area. All of these little things. Why do you think that this person is the person that will help you? And it doesn't need to be just one thing. Um, I think it's a great way to start the conversation and one way to keep it going is to always uh, send especially good news uh, and you know whenever you change jobs or something happens just say, hey I thought you'd like to know this happened and I think that that's a great way to keep in touch with your mentors. Yeah and I asked that purposely because I think that um, I bet if I asked all of you was there a mentor or, or someone in that category that you could point to that said my career success in career trajectory change because I bet you all could say yes, there was somebody who did that. Um, and I sort of look at it as the power of the university and the degree you take from this university um, uh, paired with the access and the willingness is that the one thing I've always, what I aspire to here is this notion of Longhorns helping Longhorns. Think about the sort of the embedded power and force that lives in there that I, I'm not sure we've really maximize that so i think there's a lot of work it's a it's a high class problem to have um i think there's a lot that we can do there but all right i've got two more questions for you um the first one's a little bit more sort of uh, cerebral and the other will be a little bit more fun um so the first one is obviously failure is any success was preceded by some number of failures right and jeff you, you gave us some great stories there can you can you sort of glean from that a lesson uh, for this group in terms of maybe I, I always find a story or here's how I did it uh, is 
much more impactful than uh, advice, a poster you might hang on your wall kind of advice. Um, so if you had a story there that uh, that sort of embodied whatever uh, wisdom you would pass on about overcoming, getting over, getting through, or what failure means to uh, someone who ultimately succeeds. So let's start with um, let's start with Melanie on this one. Uh, so I, I can remember one time when I was when I was in college, I was having a very a particularly rough semester, and I remember calling my mother saying, "I don't think I can do this. I don't know why I did this. I don't know why I thought I could. Um, this is just too hard for me. I, I want to switch majors. Um, I want to do something else." Um, and you know, she told me that, "Hey, it's okay. Why don't you just..." Um, you know, breathe and just kind of take the evening to relax and just, you know, go to sleep and, and wake up. And, you know, it just it was like a reset that I needed. Um, I think hearing that my family supported me no matter what I chose, you know, even though I was already two years into my major, uh, hearing my family say, hey, if that's what you want to do, we're 100 percent behind you. We're not going to stop you or change your mind on that. Um, but I ended up finishing the semester and then I was like, well, that wasn't so bad, was it? And so it's, you know, sometimes you got to step back and go, you know, maybe in the moment, you know, you could be very emotionally charged. Um, you may make a, a quick decision, but sometimes you just kind of need to put the brakes on and just kind of think about it and breathe through it, you know, sit on it maybe for a few days or weeks or for me, it, may, it took kind of a couple of months. Um, but, you know, maybe don't rush through everything either. You know, life is a journey. Um, you're not always going to go from point A to point B. Sometimes you're meant to kind of go through this winding road and go through different doors and different obstacles before you end up where you are. I can tell you I would not be where I'm at if it hadn't been for that kind of long journey that I was meant to take. Uh, so, you know, it, you don't rush to get to the end. Sometimes you're meant to go on that on that path and, and learn a lot about yourself. Um, and you'll be stronger for it. Thank you, Leticia. Yeah, I I agree with the you'll be strong for it. Nobody wins all the time, right? There's always something that's going to happen. And you're going to feel like you failed. And sometimes that failure is not even truly a failure. It's a blessing, but you just don't see it at the time. So I think that whenever you have those moments when you truly feel like you're failing, just think about, you know, there's a lesson here that I can learn or that maybe there's a sign here that I, you know, should change my past a little bit or not, as Melanie was saying. It's just um, don't take your failures personally. Everybody fails. So just, you know, try to keep going and readjust, um, reassess and just don't give up. Don't don't think that you're failing because you're a failure. Everybody fails. Jeff, for you. Yeah, I right. Failure is just an opportunity for growth. It's cliche, but it's it's so true. And you know, I think about people who are graduating right now and joining the alumni association into this crazy world and adversity and looking for jobs and it must be difficult. And and the advice I would give to them is, you know when you are forced into adversity that's when you develop that's when you're pushed out of your comfort zone and adversity acts as a catalyst to change and once you get through that adversity you can look back and say if i got through that i can get through anything and it becomes this kind of momentum effect uh where where you just become an unstoppable force because you are so good at breaking through that adversity and overcoming those challenges Sorry, Gerardo. All the you had to go last on this one. A lot of a lot of good stuff there. You, you no, know, no, 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 no. Uh, and, and, and I'll piggy, I'll piggyback on some of it. I think you know. I recently, like, uh, last week, I was talking to one of our engineers, and he made the comment to me. He goes, "Look, we on our team, we don't believe in failure. There's either success or there's an opportunity to learn." Uh, and that's it, right? Like if you can just change your mindset and look at failure from a different lens, like like Jeff was outlining, I think that's one key component. I think the other one is one that was ingrained in me at Google, and that's the two concepts. One is the concept of failing fast, right? Like don't be afraid to take that risk and to go into that opportunity, because if you're going to end up failing no matter what what you do and how hard you try, you might as well do it fast and not waste that time. So go for it. Don't, don't hesitate. Like try hard. 
try to make it happen. But if you fail, then the recovery is what's key, right? Like, and so not only should you fail faster, you should recover faster. Uh, and, and the best example that I have for that is my daughter was on a rope swing a few years ago and she slipped and landed on the deck. And as a dad, right, like my instincts already kicked in. I ran down there, made sure she was okay. But I realized that in a split second, I had to make a decision of whether I encouraged her to get back on the rope swing or not. Right. And, and if I didn't, I was afraid that she was going to be afraid of doing the rope swing because all that she was going to remember was the fact that she had fallen. And so I encouraged her to immediately get back on the rope swing and try to try it again, even though I was just as afraid that she was going to slip and hurt herself again. But I knew that that she had to recover fast in order to not have this memory of falling on the rope swing. And that was it. Right. She's never been afraid of it ever again. But I think that recovery after a failure is really, really important. Fantastic. And already, you might have been in Pittsburgh too long because that's a horse down here. It's called falling off the horse and getting back on it, getting back on it. Uh, anyway, uh, great story. So I have, I have one last one. Um, and it really occurs to me as I listen to the, the, the four of you, obviously you're on the vanguard of very different parts of our uh, human experience, whether it's cancer research or space travel or artificial intelligence and the implications with autonomous vehicles or telemedicine, which we all now know is how we're all going to consume medicine in the future, given uh, what we're going to do. I wish I was an early angel investor, Jeff. Um, but with that said, I'm just so curious, given that, again, you guys are on the vanguard, this is like when you when you lay your head down on the pillow at night and you think 20, 30, 40 years, what do you what do you dream of? Like in your respective I mean, world peace and that, but I'm talking in your your area of. So, if you project forward what you know and what you're working on, what 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 do you what do you dream and and, and think in the sort of the world of the possible? Um, so, because I picked on our let Melanie and our our expert in space travel go first on this one. <clears throat> Uh, so, yeah, uh, wow, uh, every day, every night is kind of a, a recharge night, right? It's letting go of everything that's happened, getting ready for the next day, every everything that I need to accomplish the following day. Uh, but, you know, thinking about, you know, the future, I absolutely love being a part of human space flight. Um, I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Another, uh, another person on the moon ever? You think we'll get another? Yeah. You do? Yeah. So, you know, in the short term, we're going to be taking astronauts to the International Space Station. I'll be heavily involved in that. But I absolutely see myself in some way being part of NASA's goal to um, get people back to moon and then on to Mars. You know, I've, our, I've worked with a lot of uh, NASA engineers that are doing that daily. Uh, I can't begin to tell you the challenges that we face um, to make that happen. But if there's just something that I can do to help us get there, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm all in. So we're going to be in, we're going to, we're going to land on another planet. Let me ask you, do you think, does, does, uh, are there other, I don't want to call them aliens out there, which was not, I won't call you on that. Go ahead. Jeff, on Area 51, like I'm yeah. um, um, but what's your thoughts on that? I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go the sports route on this one oh. um, and, and say that, that it's, the power of sports is so profound, both from, you know, when you're growing up playing peewee soccer to middle school, high school sports, to college, to, you know, the international stage. And I think moving forward into the future, we're going to see a, sh a shift in what that means, potentially. Um, I know specifically, like, the, the future that I'm looking at is like exactly a year from now and hoping that the Paralympics are happening. Um, but you know even moving forward with with international Par paralympic and olympic sport um i think we're potentially going to see a shift in the model for the olympics um you know there's been a lot of uh controversy in some of the games being delivered on time and at budget and is it even right to rotate every four years you know and, and so i think there's going to be a pretty big shake up um on the horizon for the Olympic and Paralympic movements. Fantastic. Leticia. Yeah, I yeah. feel like yeah. I have to say that we will have a cure for cancer. I have to say that. Yes. <laughs> cancer is not only one disease, it's many diseases. Um, so it's complicated, but I think that it could happen. Not, not only that, though, but also making sure that everybody 
who needs it have access to that cure. As you said, uh, as I mentioned, I do a lot of work with the Affordable Care Act. So having a cure, having a treatment does not mean that everybody who needs it is going to get it. So having more science driven policy uh, with all of the studies that we do is like this group of epidemiologists now during the pandemic going, I told you so. You know? yeah. um, I think that having more of the policy and more of the government be involved with the science that goes uh, through understanding how these diseases work and then how it can make the greatest impact and the most good to the population uh, through our scientific findings, I think it would be a beautiful world. Yeah, I think it's probably reasonable. To, our experience with the pandemic will translate uh, beyond simple vaccine to a sort of a broader, I, I think that's right, I agree. Well, that's, that's certainly encouraging. Um, Gerardo, you are intentionally, I left you laugh, last because I need to leave this meeting with the prospects of not having to sit on 35 in my car, uh, getting ready to like lose my mind. Um, so tell us what we think about autonomous vehicles and, and give us hope, please. Yeah, so I mean, look, our, our mission- Policy makers aren't going to solve it. We know that, um, but go it's ahead. Certain, it's certainly going to be a partnership, right, between government and industry uh, to make this happen. And I look, the, our company's mission is to deliver the benefits of self-driving technology safely, quickly, broadly. Um, the, the reality is that we have 40,000 people on U.S. roads lose their lives every single year. Right. And if we can begin to make a difference in saving those people's lives, like not only are we making a huge impact uh, to make our roads safer, but we're making an impact to every single one of those families or friends who've been touched by losing somebody on the roads. Uh, but on top of that, you know, we believe that self-driving technology uh, will not only reduce your commute, Right and and make our systems a lot more efficient. It's you know if you think about how much time you spend every single week uh, on the road stuck in traffic, uh, imagine if that if that time can be much more productive and the amount of productivity that we bring into the business community and into the education system. You know I always think about wh who who is that self uh, that that single parent who has to take three different bus routes to get to work, uh, and if we can give that family their time back. Uh, with that parent? Or what does it mean if we can turn a parking lot into a park and we can revitalize the urban core of cities across the country because we can use that land better uh, than what it is right now, right? Like your car is unused 95% of the time, right? It doesn't need to be parked downtown in prime real estate when that that when that space and that land can be used in such in, in a much more productive way. Uh, so that's, that's that world that we think about uh, when we're able to deploy this technology at scale. I'm really thinking about that person in the left lane that's going slow. There's like 10 cars of open space in front of them. How do we how do we fill that gap, man? That's what I'm talking about. Well, anyway, um, so, so I wanted to thank you all. I mean, you guys represent the best of, of us all. So it's we're so proud of your accomplishments and, you know, you're only getting started. So um, you're the, a fine representation of our university and, and it just couldn't um, have enjoyed this hour and a half with you more. Um, we do have a little closing video that I wanted to share with you as we close tonight, but thank you again. We appreciate um, you and, and all that you've done and will do for um, our university and in fact the world. So with that, we'll close with our closing video. Texas, Texas. I hope you said yeehaw. Listen, I know that we cannot all be together, but I wanted to send my very best to each of you and say, first off, congrats on being an outstanding young Texas. Wait, that everyone's young? Let Gerardo and Teriano is not young. I just got that note. So congrats to the rest of you who are the young Texas exes and congrats to you too, Gerardo, on being an outstanding representation of our amazing university. Hope that y'all enjoy it. Hey, enjoy the check that they're gonna get. Uh, there's no money? There's no money this year? Oh, what do they get? No okay, well, enjoy the award. It's, it's an amazing honor, <laughs> even without the money. <laughs> but seriously, y'all, enjoy this honor and thank you for being the very best of Texas. Hook em. Congratulations, 2020 Outstanding Young Texas Exes and Hook'em Horns. Hey, fellow Longhorns. I just want to take the time to say congratulations to all the outstanding Young Texas Exes recipients 
from one recipient to another. It is a great honor. Continue to change the world and hook them horns. Congratulations to all the outstanding young Texas exes. Each and every one of you deserve this award. Hook them.